Hey Riot family, so I wanted to create uh, a YouTube video for those of you who don't have access to the Instagram live feature that we have. And so I wanted to give a brief devotional um, through the scripture that we're going to be covering in our small groups tonight and for you to use with your small group, for you to use with your family, uh, for some small group discussion, uh, application questions, and, and how we can uh, let God's word impact our lives. Um, and, and before I dive into today's verse passage, I want to actually do some review because I know it's been a couple weeks since we've been together uh, and and uh, we may need some refreshers. I know I certainly do. So we are in the book of James this semester and thus far we have we have learned a ton. But just to give a brief recap so we know that James was written by James who we learned was the, the brother of Jesus who at first did not believe in his own brother but as as he witnessed the crucifixion and the resurrection, he ended up becoming one of the uh, big church leaders within the early church in Jerusalem. And so James is writing to the 12 tribes in the dispersion. So he's writing to Jews and believers who have been scattered around the, around the world, the known world, because of persecution within the church. And he has he kind of started us off with a reminder to count our trials as joy. And what a what an amazing insight for us in this time that we're living in with the with the COVID-19 pandemic, whatever your situation may be, um, to know that we can consider it all joy. To know that trials in our lives uh, produce steadfastness, and steadfastness, when it has its full effect, allows us to become perfect and complete. So we can allow these situations, these changes, when we trust in the Lord and seek his wisdom to make us a more complete um, believer, to make us a more complete and equipped follower of Jesus, so that we can, our faith can grow and we can trust in him. So we've walked through um, so much scripture, but we looked at what it is between hearing and doing the word, the difference between just hearing and doing, like a man who looks at himself in the mirror and then walks away and, and forgets what he looks like. When we hear the word, when we know the stories, when we know the Sunday school verses and all those things, but we never actually apply it, 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 we fall short. And so there's a call for us to apply God's word. And then we went through chapter two and looked at the, the sin of partiality and how God calls us not to make distinctions among believers um, to show some people good preference and, and other people not, which was happening in the church. Uh, and, and, and then again, just a reminder that faith without works is dead. That if we say that we have faith and yet we aren't displaying fruit in our lives uh, of someone who's been changed by Jesus Christ, that that's a dead faith. And so we want to live our lives in such a way that we display um, a love for Jesus, a love for God in everything that we do. Then we talked about the tongue and how difficult it is to tame our tongue apart from the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Uh, and how it is from God that we get wisdom. It's from God that we get help in order to do that. Uh, and then we looked uh, uh, at uh, the source of sin and quarrels in our life and how it comes from within that that we, when we put our trust in ourselves, will fall short every time. That uh, that the way to um, handle problems and quarrels and fights and sin is to look within and see what it is that we are doing that is falling short from obedience to God's word. And today, um, I want to jump into to chapter 5. And I'm just going to read this through and then we'll break it down. And I'll give some application questions at the end for you to use uh, with your friends, with your family, whoever it is that you're going to be discussing this with. So James says this, and I want you guys to really pay attention to the language that he uses because it's some of the strongest, um, most difficult language. I mean, just some of the descriptions that he's going to use are, are powerful. So, so give a listen to this. He says, come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded, and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Man. I don't know about you, but that is some humbling words. And I, and I heard a, a teacher once say that the temptation when you're reading these verses is to think, man, this just doesn't really apply to me. I'm not really falling into this at all. And so I want to encourage you that as we read this to, to just really take time to evaluate your heart. Like, man, where does this apply to me? Where is maybe the author talking to me about this? And so 
just jumping in, I really believe that this coronavirus, I really believe that whether or not you are affected by it in, with the sickness itself or whether you just had your life flipped upside down because of it or schedule changed, it's exposing idols. It is exposing the things that we have clung on to, whether it's safety or security, whether it's our schedule, whether it's uh, fill in the blank, whatever it may be that you may be holding on to that's not God. And, and I think that this passage really dives into that same concept. And so just looking at that first couple of verses where he says, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that are coming upon you. You know, I think what James is trying to tell us here is that, that there's a coming judgment, right? For, for the rich here, that those who have, have used their wealth and use what they have for themselves, that there is a, a sobering reality to the fact that judgment is coming one day and, and it's coming soon. And, and what, will we, what will we present before God on that day? Uh, and he's saying for those who have lived for themselves, man, they're going to weep and howl for the miseries. It says your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. What a reminder that the things of this earth, the temporary things, the money, the popularity, the stuff we have, it can be gone in an instant. And we've seen that in the past two weeks, right? Like things can change. I know there are lots of families with parents or siblings or different people who have lost jobs, who have all of a sudden their source of income is gone. And the thing that they were holding on to, maybe their money was their idol, all of a sudden it's not there. And there's just a reality that the temporal things of this world are not going to last. And, and, and he even tells us that, that the gold and silver they had are corroded and that corrosion is evidence against them. The things that we store up on this earth, the things that we put our hope in are actually going to serve as evidence against us in the day of judgment. And so are we clinging to those things or are we clinging to the things of God? Are we clinging to his promises? Are we clinging to his word? Are we seeking to live for him? I think what James is saying in, in a financial term is that these people's assets, the things that they thought that they had that were benefiting them, have actually become liabilities. That they are actually now testifying against them, saying that that's what they used their time on this earth for. They, they didn't use it responsibly. They didn't use it faithfully to what God has called them to. You know, there, there's a reality that James has taught us in uh, chapter 4 that, that to know the right thing to do and not to do it, that it's sin. Even if you're not actively doing something that's sinful, but to know what's right and to not do it, to know there's a need and not to meet it, to know that people are suffering and not to help them, that is sin. And so especially now, but always, we need to be looking for ways to use what God has given us, use our talents, our time, our treasure, um, whatever it is to serve him, to make sure that we are living for him, to make sure that we are um, living for his kingdom and his glory. And then verses 4 and 5, he goes on to, to give a huge warning. He says, Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. So what's, what's James saying here? I believe he's saying that, you know, if we've done anything deceptive, if we've used our means deceptively, if we have done anything that's been harmful to others, that God sees it. We may think that we're getting away with cheating someone or with, uh, or with cutting corners, but God sees it and he knows. And, and that um, when we live in luxury and self-indulgence, when we live for ourselves, it says that we are fattening, fattening our hearts in a day of slaughter. You know, one of my first times ever coming to Scott City, uh, we were driving to Emily's house and she took me to go see her dad's um, shop. And we drove past Percival's packing and I saw a cow being led to the slaughter. And it just, it's always stuck with me, um, just the image of that when it comes to this verse and, and other verses in scripture that speak to very similar concepts that, you know, when we live for ourselves, when we indulge in the treasures of this earth without living for the kingdom of heaven, it's like we're that cow getting fattened up, getting ready to be led to the slaughter. There's a very real judgment that's coming one day. And God's going to ask us, what did you do with the time that I gave you? And I want to make sure that we can say to him, Lord, I lived for you rather than I lived for me. I want to be able to say that, God, I used what you gave me. And I want to tell you guys, I am not perfect and by any means. You can ask anyone that knows me. I have fallen short, but my desire is that I would get to use what it is that God has given me uh, for his glory. And so a couple of questions I just have. Um, 
you know, wh where are we living for ourselves? Maybe, maybe take some time with your family or your small group and just ask this question. Where have we lived for ourselves? Where have we lived in self-indulgence? And, and then to follow that question up is how can we use what we have, whether it's time, whether it's resources, whatever it may be, how can we use that to serve others? Specifically, right now in the time of the, of the COVID-19 pandemic, how can we use what we have to serve those who may be struggling? Because there's a reality that people in Scott City today are struggling, have lost their jobs, are unable to get to the grocery store. How can we serve them and love them? and, uh, and uh, share the good news of Jesus with those people because there's a lot of people out there who are anxious, who are fearful, who don't know of the eternal hope that there is in Jesus Christ. And that's what I want to come back to is that there's nothing greater that we can do for anybody. Yes, we can meet physical needs, and that is such a good thing that we can do as believers, but spiritually to share with them the good news of Jesus, that there is an eternal hope that can give them a peace that surpasses all comprehension in Jesus, man, Let's share that good news. Let's, let's make that message known loud and clear to our peers, to our neighbors, to our friends. Um, let's make sure that we are looking inwardly as we read this passage, not looking outwardly and saying, well, I know someone who's doing this, but rather, how am I doing this? How am I living for myself? Um, and how can I live for Jesus every day? And I believe it starts with a daily devotion to God's word. Let's make sure that we are in this book on a regular basis and that every time we learn something new about God or about us or about how we can live, that we're seeking to apply that to our life, that we seek to apply what we learn about God to how we can worship him and for his character and his attributes and how that should lead us to obedience to his word and his call. So let's be marked as as believers who who aren't, weighed down by our stuff, who aren't controlled by the, the circumstances and the things around us, but rather let's be marked by the reality. Let's be consumed with joy for the reality that Jesus is coming back and, and that we're going to get a chance to stand before him and tell him what we did with the time that we were given. And so let's seek to live for him and to fulfill the greatest commandments, which are to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. Let's be that way uh, every day. Let's seek to live for him. And uh, yeah, we're in this together. So I'd love to close this in a word of prayer. And then, yeah, we'll, I'll get out of here. Father, I thank you so much for this day. Thank you for the, the people who have taken time to watch this video. I pray, Lord, you would just help us to, uh, to examine our hearts to see where is it, Lord, that we have lived in luxury and self-indulgence? Where is it that we have lived with what you've given us to serve ourselves? Uh, I pray, God, that you would convict our hearts that you would show us um, how we can serve others around us and ultimately serve you. Uh, and I ask God, if there's anyone watching this who hasn't fully surrendered to you and to your goodness, that they would see that um, what you offer is far greater than anything this world can give. First Chronicles 29, 11 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, and you are exalted as head over all. And so we worship you, God. We give you praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll see you guys next time.